Stan Gibalisco here again, W1GV Ham Radio Station, Whiskey One Golf Victor, although I rarely use those phonetics because I rarely use voice communications modes, I prefer CW, Morse code that is, and PSK31. On 20 meters you'll find me occasionally running 7 watts on PSK and 10 watts on CW with a vertical antenna mounted on my deck. I believe that I have made a video about that antenna, maybe more than one, in this same playlist. I also made a video about a simple antenna tuner that will tune practically anything at the high frequencies, that is uh, 160 meters, well technically that's medium frequencies, but on 160, 80, and 40 meters particularly, uh, that video is called a, a tu I believe it's called a wire, simple wire tuner, something like that. Anyway, the circuit is very much like this and operates on very much the same principle, but this circuit is flipped exactly inside out from that one, and there's a reason for that. I'm hoping someday, not too long from now, that we radio hams will get a band right around 500 kilohertz. That's a half a megahertz, and I believe that falls into the medium frequency band, but it's, uh, it's just below the standard AM broadcast band in terms of frequencies. We might also get uh, another band right down around somewhere around 170 kilohertz. I'm not exactly sure. They're working on something for both of those um, bands. But if we're going to operate at 500 kilohertz, that is an awfully, awfully long wavelength. 500 kilohertz. If you take the uh, familiar formula for a dipole antenna, 467 divided by the frequency in megahertz for a half-wave dipole. Let's just try that. Let's just uh, make that calculation. 467 divided by 0.5. That's a 934-foot length for a dipole antenna. You can divide that by 2 you're a little over 450 feet for a full-size quarter-wave vertical antenna. Well, I don't think you're going to do that. <laughs> you might fly a kite or a balloon with a 450-foot wire on it, but the Federal Aviation Administration might get on your case for that. And even so, you're going to have a to deal with a, a pretty good ground radial system to get an antenna like that to work. If you want to do a half wavelength antenna, it'd have to be 934 feet long, roughly. And if you're going to fly a, a captive balloon or a kite with a wire that long, there are an awful lot of hazards with that. And, and I won't even get into that except to say don't do it without further information. Just say that's just out of the question. Unless you happen to be out in the middle of the ocean somewhere and are willing to take the risk of electrostatic buildup on a wire like that. But anyway, getting back to what kind of an antenna is going to be of practical use, you're probably going to need to use an inductively loaded vertical. And when you do that, you're going to end up with a very low radiation resistance and uh, it's probably going to be only about one ohm. It's going to be extremely low radiation resistance. So if you can get your entire antenna, the coil and the whip for the inductively loaded antenna, if you can get that whole thing to resonate at, let's just say 500 kilohertz as a hypothetical. If you can get that to resonate, and maybe it's oh, uh, 75 feet high if you're lucky, if you can get an antenna that tall, it's still going to have an extremely low, purely resistive impedance. And most transmatches today cannot match anything like that. And besides, they don't even make them yet for this frequency. But you can. 
And this is my theoretical design. I have not tested it, but I don't see why it shouldn't work. It's the same principle that I uh, described in the video about the half wavelength uh, antenna, except rather than connecting the antenna to the top of the inductor and the radio to the tap, we do exactly the reverse. Now, a one millihenry inductor, you can wind that on a toroidal core and you're going to have to make a bunch of taps on that. You might even wind it on a solenoidal uh, core. But you're going to have to make a bunch of taps and by experiment find the position that works the best. But a one millihenry inductor with a 100 picofarad variable capacitor will resonate at approximately 500 kilohertz. Actually, this is the actual capacitance. You might rather uh, do with a 200 picofarad. I'll just adjust the type size here so that everything looks really nice for you. A 200 picofarad variable capacitor. All right. Well, I'm working on this. I resized everything here and Aren't you having fun laughing at me? Anyway, here you can examine the schematic while I'm fiddling around with it. A 200 picofarad variable right about in the middle of its range should resonate at around 500 kilohertz according to this formula. And remember, the frequency in hertz equals 1 divided by 2 pi times the square root of the product of the inductance in henrys and the capacitance in farads. So you can go ahead and check my math and see if 100 picofarads here and 1 millihenry will resonate at 500 kilohertz. Anyway, 500 kilohertz is the uh, hypothetical that we're using just uh, to get some ballpark values for the components. You have a tank circuit here then. This tank circuit this is what they called it back in the day. Back in the day when I was training for my ham radio license, they called a parallel resonant circuit like this a tank. I'm not sure exactly why. I guess it's because it would store electromagnetic energy. And what you get then is, here's your radio at the top. This is the tank circuit, and it acts like a variable transformer for purely resistive impedances. 50 ohms up here at the top. That's uh, what your radio wants is 50 ohms, most radios anyway, and 0 ohms all the way down here at the earth ground. So if you adjust this tap along these turns you can get anything from 0 up to 50 ohms. Well this is probably as I said this this antenna combination right here, if it's uh, of reasonable size, is probably going to present you with a 1 or 2 ohm uh, purely resistive impedance. So you're going to have to put the tap pretty down near close to the bottom. If you adjust it by experiment, you should be able to get a match to your radio. And this is, of course, the coax to the radio and this whole tuner by the way is right at the base of the antenna. I have not shown the ground symbol for the shield on the coax just because it would clutter things up but this tuner then you need to have out there at the base of the antenna. This earth ground also needs to be an excellent radio frequency ground because if it's not you're going to have a horrifically low efficiency for your antenna. Uh, just awful. You're going to need to put down as many radials as you can, make them as long as you can. Uh, I, you know, it, it, it's going to be very hard to get a very efficient antenna like this. But you're going to have to just try the, the best you can to get a decent result with this. And basically, the heavier duty the wires you use in your coils, the lower the loss in your capacitor, the lower the loss in your ground, you're just going to want to do everything as if you were intending to run a megawatt 
so that you have the lowest possible ohmic losses everywhere. That'll give you the best efficiency that you can reasonably expect. And I'm not going to tell you that you're going to get more than 10 or 20 percent efficiency at the very max out of an antenna like this. But everybody else is going to have the same problem unless they <laughs> are flying balloons and kites and uh, getting themselves into trouble with the Federal Aviation Administration and uh, the atmospheric supercapacitor, which is waiting there to zap them with electrostatic discharge on a wire like that. Anyway, uh, I'm kind of chit-chatting here, but you can, you've doubtless had time to examine this schematic. It is a theoretical design. It's the drawing board design, but when and if we get a band down here, and I'm hoping we do, uh, I'll be the first one on the air on that band, I reckon. I'll go out to Wyoming somewhere, find a little real estate, pound a few ground rods down, lay a few miles of copper in the earth, and get on the air on the long wave band. So that is all I have here. Stan Gibalisco, W1GV. I got this call sign, W1GV, because it has a nice ring to it on CW. Da da da. Da 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 dit da 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 da. Send that at 15 words a minute in a contest. You only got to send it once. Drop it right in there when nobody else is on the frequency. I've worked DX out of pileups with 10 watts, competing against guys with a lot more power and better antennas just by dropping this nice rhythmic CW call sign in there in exactly the right spot. So with that I'll say 73 and so long once again from the Black Hills of Dakota Territory, United States of America. <laughs>